I hate it about this business that doing things wrong is the process. You know, writing a sentence the wrong way is the process, writing the story the wrong way is the process, getting your book proposal wrong the first time is the process, but that is what it is. Welcome to Queries, Qualms, and Quirks, the weekly podcast that asks published authors to share their successful query letter and discuss their journey from first spark to day of publication. I am your host, author Sarah Nicholas and literary agent Sarah N. Fisk. Catherine Babb Magira is a writer and journalist who has contributed to The Wall Street Journal, Slate, CNBC, and NBC News, a frequent podcast and radio guest with appearances on NPR and Lifehackers Upgrade. She lives in Richmond, Virginia with her husband and toddler. Her first book, Poe for Your Problems, Uncommon Advice from History's Least Likely Self-Help Guru, was released by Hachette in 2021 and won the International Poe Festival Saturday Visitor Award in 2022. So please welcome Catherine to the show. Hello. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, of course. So today we're going to talk about your journey to publication, and we're going to start by going all the way back to the beginning. When did you first start getting interested in writing? And then how long did it take from there before you started getting serious about pursuing publication? Well, I think like a lot of people, I first realized as a kid that this is something I wanted very much. I've always been very single-minded about it, which in some ways is a gift and in other ways is a curse because it's not an easy thing to get into. From the time in elementary school, when my fourth grade teacher read us The Raven in class, and I just had this sort of epiphany of what art is and what words can do, I've thought, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I'm still chasing that goal and still falling short of it. Anyway, though, after elementary, middle, high school, I was an English major at the University of South Carolina, and then I did a master's degree in creative writing in New Zealand at the University of Auckland. I always wanted to write fiction, so I completed a first novel in 2006, and I think I sent my first queries right about then in the mid-aughts. I got nowhere for so long. I queried for 12 years before I got an agent. I wrote three different novels, and each one was a bit more commercial than the last and a bit better than the last. (laughs) But it was really, it was a long haul. And with those, I, as many times as I queried, I mean, more than 100 times, I never got anywhere. I've always been a freelance journalist too, since I left school. So that started off with like local publications and alt weeklies in my hometown and very gradually became writing for national publications. So I was always doing a nonfiction thing too, but it really wasn't my first love. I considered myself kind of a struggling novelist, (laughs) but after these three projections and, you know, 10 solid years of writing time and querying time, I just was very, very depressed. And I started reading Poe for the first time since I was a little kid. And then I got the idea for this nonfiction book. As I was reading Poe in the depths of my depression, it was so bad. I really shouldn't gloss this over. I mean, it was so bad. I could not eat or sleep. I had Mm. to take mental health leave from my job. I really couldn't function. And Poe kind of helped me through this. Again, very gradually, I started to have this epiphany with him of just realizing that he was sort of a fellow traveler in this mental health struggle that I was going through. And it turns out that's not at all a new view or a new read of Poe at all. Like the French mm-hmm. have sort of always read him that way. And a number of other writers, so many writers have written about their experience of Poe. So I wrote about this in an essay for The Millions, and that went sort of viral and ended up sort of proving out the book idea. So how did you learn more about the publishing industry, like how it works, how to query, how to go about everything? By failing. Really, it was just by making every mistake that you can make. My earliest queries were just not very good. I didn't really know how to pitch. And so I kind of learned all of these things over a long, hard period, how to pitch freelance pieces and also how to query Mm -hmm. and what the publishing industry really looks like. I would occasionally get feedback from agents. I also used to go to writing conferences and that sort of thing too. Mm -hmm. So I would be getting often harsh feedback or uh, straight rejections. And I was just trying to not internalize this too much that I couldn't go on, but also to take the criticism to heart. One thing I can remember hearing from a contest judge early on as she was rejecting me, she said, why don't you write about something other people are interested in? Oh my God. <laughs> Which is one of the harshest things that's ever been said to me. But also it did 
end up informing my career a whole lot because nowadays I consider audience so much when I write even a small piece. So as mm -hmm. hard as that was to hear, it did teach me something. And ever since, I've been very attuned to audience and even to putting numbers to audiences. Like when mm -hmm. I finally had a successful query letter, I got into a lot of data in the query itself, which I think is somewhat unusual. Granted, it's for a nonfiction project, so it's a little mm -hmm. bit more appropriate there. But yeah, using market data has become a huge thing for me. Wow. She literally said no one cares to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more or less in those words. Ugh. Wow. So then what happened from the time that your essay at the millions went viral to signing your first book contract? Well, my first agent actually had liked the piece on Twitter and that's how I got her name. But she's a wonderful person and a big fancy literary agency. After I wrote the essay, I was combing around the internet for information about who had liked it, looking mm -hmm. at publications that had shared it, looking at individuals who had liked it on Twitter. And for instance, like Michiko Kakatani of the New York Times had liked it on Twitter and I put that on my query, <laughs> in my query letter. A couple of months after finishing the essay, I had a book proposal I was ready to send out. I sent that with my query to eight agents and four of those came back offering representation. So I had a phone call with every one of them and it was a really difficult choice to try and figure out who I wanted to work with because they all seemed great. And also I was just totally blown away by this because I've never gotten <laughs> anywhere before. And mm -hmm. as far as I could tell, there wasn't a whole lot of information or articles about how to pick and choose when competing offers look good. Mm -hmm. So I was asking my longtime writing mentor, who's a historian and has a literary agent, published a number of well-regarded books. I asked him for advice, but really there was no one. <laughs> I don't know that I made the greatest choice in that my first agent that I worked with, who did not sell the book, she really had kind of a highfalutin vision of it, where it'd be yeah. a very sort of highbrow literary title. Mm. And I think one of the reasons that didn't, so she did send it out. We went on submission almost right away. Mm -hmm. We went to on submission to 16 editors at once at the fanciest houses you can imagine. <laughs> and every single one rejected, mm. which was incredibly difficult to deal with because after all the, the fanfare around the querying period that had gone so well, I assumed we would get a quick sale and most of the agents I was speaking to thought we would get a quick sale. And then when we mm -hmm. didn't, I was just floored. I didn't know what to do, really. And then from there, after that 16-round rejection, <laughs> I decided I might try and take the project in a little bit of a different direction. Instead of imagining this as a literary title, I thought, what if I take this more in a mass market direction and also make it more of a funny book? Because mm -hmm. I, I love humor and writing and I wanted to lean into that angle in part because it's just so hard to spend time with a project that's really dark and it's about your depression. Yeah. <laughs> so I retooled the book proposal and I went back to the agents who had offered me representation the first time around. And my current agent who ended up selling the book, Andrea Somberg, was the person who reacted the most enthusiastically. And I loved this about her because... You know, when you switch agents at this point in a submission process, you have to tell them you've been rejected by 16 <laughs> huge houses mm -hmm. or labels or imprints or whatever you might call it. And one of the agents who I approached again, she was like, this is everyone who I would send it out to. So no, I don't mm -hmm. think I'm interested in working with you. Whereas Andrea is just such a cool, feisty, smart person. She's like, ah, I know some people who I think will be into this. So we're going to tweak it a little bit and then we'll get to them and we're going to go out to them on a sort of one by one basis rather than a mass round. And that was great because we did get a few rejections in that process, but each time we were getting feedback from the editor so we could then change the book proposal to address whatever that concern was. And by the time we had gone through a couple of those sorts of encounters. We thought it was at a good enough place that we would go out with a multiple submission again. So I think at that point, we went to four or five editors. And at that point, we got an auction. After all that rigmarole, uh, it did sell at auction. We had three bidders. And eventually, Hachette was the one to buy it. Their imprint running press ended up publishing mm -hmm. it. Yeah, when you said that your first agent had kind of a literary 
idea vision for it and then i'm like i'm checking your title i'm like wait that title is it's very like pop humory and so yeah <laughs> it makes sense now and i love hearing that because sometimes people think that if their book dies on submission like that's the end of it and so i love mm -hmm. that you told the story because it it's never the end right <laughs> it's not and i mean i if i had myself to talk to you back then be like, it's okay. It's not the end of the road, even when you get a mass round of rejections. And I had to rewrite my proposal three different times, just top to bottom. Mm. I didn't know to expect that. It's actually not unusual. And even switching agents inside of, you know, a single book is not that unusual either. I've heard it from other writers since. Mm -hmm. But as you're experiencing it, you know, it feels like one of these bumps in the road just feels apocalyptic. So... I hope yeah. folks yeah, take away sure. that you can just keep going. It is time for the first cue of the podcast. Can you read your successful query letter for us? Sure. Hi, agent's first name. I'm contacting you after coming across your profile and realizing that you agented book title as well as book title. My name is Catherine Babagira, and I'm a writer who's contributed to New York Magazine's The Cut, Playboy.com, Salon.com, and FastCompany.com, among others. My June 2016 Quartz essay, Millennials Are Obsessed with Side Hustles Because They're All We've Got, has been shared on Facebook more than 50,000 times and also became the focus of an April 2017 episode of NPR's On Point. I've just finished a nonfiction book proposal that I believe may be right up your alley, one that comes with some nice proof of concept, too. In September of 2017, my essay, Edgar Allan Poe Was a Broke-Ass Freelancer, ran on the millions. It quickly became one of the site's most popular articles of the entire year and was picked up and shared by blogs and magazines, including Publishers Weekly and Arts and Letters Daily. Even Michiko Kakatani liked the story on Twitter. But that piece was just a small excerpt from a much larger project I've been working on. It's called How to Say Never More to Your Problems, Surprisingly Great Life Advice from Edgar Allan Poe, the World's Most Miserable Writer. To put it glibly, it's the world's first ever self-help book based on Poe. It's one part Alanda Botton's How Bruce can, Bruce can Change Your Life, one part Jen Sincero's You Are a Badass. As you might expect, I've had a lot of book ideas over the last few years, but I ran with this Poe idea because the commercial potential was obvious to me from the beginning. Poe fans are legion. He has 4 million fans on Facebook alone, and there are Poe museums in New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Richmond, Virginia. Demand for works of Poe biography and criticism has stayed strong for nearly 200 years. And yet, while so much ink has been spilled, no one has ever looked to Poe for advice on how to live a fulfilling, worthy life. This unique new angle occurred to me when I was suffering from a nervous breakdown in 2016, which is the starting point for this book and put some of the narrative in the narrative nonfiction. My hunch is that you'll like the voice and the direction I've taken with this premise, so I'm attaching my proposal in first chapter. If you'd like to discuss them, you can reach me by email or at my phone number. Thank you for your time and consideration, Kat. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that with us. I love the title of the article. <laughs> okay. So how has your experience been since signing that contract? Especially let us know if there was anything that particularly surprised you along the way. So I signed my deal in November of 2019. And uh, none of us knew what we were heading into at that time, but I was on deadline to write a book in 2020, which is a really interesting situation. I was also pregnant and having my first child in July of that year. So it was a wild year. And I also, I work full time. So to try and fit all these things in when the world itself feels like it's melting down. Mm -hmm. I don't know. One thing I will say I, I learned through that, though, is it's really nice to have a project to focus on when it feels like the world is going crazy and even like my body is going crazy. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that genuinely surprised me was the level of marketing input I had with the publisher. At least with my publisher, they wanted suggestions about the back cover copy, mm -hmm. even to Amazon, some of the copy that goes on Amazon and a lot of the marketing strategy input. And in part, that's because I put myself forward to do those things. Like I work in marketing and as my day job. Mm -hmm. I had input on um, the timing of the book release. So the book was actually ready for months before we actually released it. And the reasoning behind that was because 
in a lot of ways, my book is a strongly seasonal title. Poe is top of mind around Halloween. So instead of releasing it in spring when it was ready, we thought we'll release it in early September and then we'll really catch the fall season. I did not realize how strong a seasonal angle is for books. Mm -hmm. It really, um, it put a lot of juice into the launch and gave me a sort of talking point for every interview that I did for the first couple of months of the book's release. And I think we were more successful in our pitching for news coverage and that sort of thing because we could work the seasonal angle. For instance, we got a blurb in the Washington Post, which is a great thing and not easy to obtain, at least uh, with my background. (laughs) But we pitched it like, you should include this book as part of your Halloween books roundup. And Mm -hmm. that's how we got in there. So I always say now to people, like if there is a Mother's Day tie-in or a Father's Day tie-in, any kind of holiday tie-in that really helps place media stories. It also just gives you something to talk about. I have booked a lot of podcasts and also discussions with community organizations and giving lectures and that sort of thing because there's a seasonal angle to the whole book. Yeah, I would not have believed how much the publisher wants to hear from you and how much (laughs) direction you're allowed to take with it. Another thing I didn't realize either, which I feel like is a little known secret, but when your book is about to come to market, you have a call with your publisher, like a PR and marketing call. I've heard since that the number of people on that call on the publisher side indicates exactly how much excitement they have. (laughs) So if you've got one person, okay, at least they're doing it. But if you've got several, it means there's some sort of institutional excitement around it. I don't know if that's precisely true, but a number of other authors have told me that's been their experience too. It is time for the quick round. I call it author DNA. Some of it is fiction focused, but since you've written fiction, I'm going to go ahead and leave those ones in. Are you a pantser or a plotter? Plotter. Do you tend to be an overwriter or an underwriter? Underwriter. Do you prefer to write in the morning or at night? <laughs> morning. When starting a project, do you typically start with a character or plot or concept or something else first? Concept. Do you prefer coffee or tea? Coffee. When writing, do you prefer silence or some kind of sound? Silence. When it comes to the first draft, are you more of a get it down kind of person or a get it right kind of person? Get it down. What tools or software do you use to draft? Word. I know that's such a dorky answer. (laughs) Do you prefer drafting or revising more? Drafting. (laughs) The listeners can't hear, but she squinted. (laughs) (laughs) Both are horrible. (laughs) Close my eyes and choose one, basically. Do you write in sequential order or do you hop around? Sequential. And final quick round question, are you an extrovert or an introvert? Introvert, hard. (laughs) All right, now we're going to talk about the second cue of the podcast. What were some of the qualms or worries that you had on your journey? And were they realized or did you overcome them or how did they shake out? I don't know. Like, I'm not making any grand claim to having faced adversity. I come from a middle class background, but I was very self-conscious about not having gone to fancy schools. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when we are on the kick of trying to sell the book as a highbrow literary project. I, mm-hmm. I just felt like these people are going to find out that I went to a state university and they're never going to <laughs> want to pursue this. I don't know. That was probably just in my head, but I didn't really have any fancy, fancy credentials to lean on. When I looked around, it seemed like the journalists I knew who were selling nonfiction projects easily anywhere, they had all gone to Princeton or you know, written for the New York Times for three years. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any of that. So I thought it would totally hold me back from a sale. And I think what in some ways was a real saving grace was the experience I had working in corporate marketing, where I'm really (laughs) comfortable talking about sales angles and pushing them. And is kind of, it's a bit of a grittier, less highbrow experience or positively lowbrow experience, but Mm -hmm. I found it to, um, that I had learned a lot that way, and it was extremely helpful to know. I worried that the book was too weird to (laughs) find a publisher or readers. I hear often now, this is such a weird niche project. How did you find a publisher? And the way I tried to get around that was by citing all this data, like the fact that Edgar Allan Poe has more Facebook fans than Danielle Steele or James Patterson. That's how big (laughs) he is. I really kind of sold it on his platform and not my own because I did have those concerns about platform. Being an introvert, I'm not really good at Twitter. 
I only got Instagram last year and I still barely understand what a story is. Uh, <laughs> so not being socially adept in those ways was a concern I had too. But uh, fortunately, in the best way, this project was not about me and that made it a lot easier. Mm. And the third cue, do you have any writing quirks? Is there anything about your writing process that you think is kind of different or interesting or unique? I'm like the opposite of a coffee snob. Uh, <laughs> I drink instant, like crappy instant oh, coffee no. while I'm writing. <laughs> I know, it's so terrible. I, I like, feel like I'm shocking people with my bad taste. Anyway, I get up really early in the morning because I have a toddler and a partner mm-hmm. uh, and a job. If I don't get up at four or five, like I'm not going to get writing time. So it's dark outside. I really like that. I like feeling like I almost have the house to myself. I drink my crappy coffee and I have AirPods and so I can't hear anything and the noise is canceling. And that's when I do it all. The good thing about it is like by seven o'clock, my writing day is done. And mm-hmm. if I feel like I've at least put in the time, then I'm going to have a decent day. So the next question I always ask is when you were in the lowest parts of your journey, what kept you going and why did you stick to it? And you kind of talked about that a little bit with Poe. Is there anything you want to add? One thing that struck me when I started reading Poe again, when I was in that place of being so down, like I was just spending all day crying in my bathtub. Like that's how bad things were. Mm -hmm. And I started reading some of the stories and like I can remember the first lines of the pit and the pendulum. I was sick, sick onto death with that long agony. Mm -hmm. And the thought I had or the realization was that Poe wasn't just talking about the Spanish Inquisition and physical torture. He's really talking about the pain of the psychological, psychological pain and the pain of the human condition that we all deal with. And the fact that he was talking on two levels in that way, I love it when writers are able to do that. Like one of the things I enjoy in horror, see with like a Jordan Peele, when the story concept is working on a literal and a metaphorical level, Mm -hmm. I always find that really beautiful. So I realized that Poe was talking about some very dark things at the same time that he was writing enormously successful commercial fiction, Mm. which was an inspiring thing to see as a writer, like how much depth and profundity he gets into a commercial product, which gives me a lot more respect. I mean, I've always had respect for commercial writers, but even more now. Then in in the time when the book was getting rejected, there was more bathtub crying (laughs) then, (laughs) but... uh, I don't know. I think I've always just really had kind of a chip on my shoulder <laughs> of wanting to prove myself. And also I'm, um, I'm a middle child of seven children. Like my parents are super mm-hmm. Catholic and I'm like your dead middle child. So I've always wanted to like tell the world my version of events. And I think my whole career has kind of been about pursuing that even, and you know, there's been a lot of times where the career wasn't going well. (laughs) And I just kept at it because there's some like dogged thing in me that I just feel like I have to get it out. And at this point, I don't think I could stop if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. It's almost like writing is a bad habit now. Do you feel like you made any mistakes along the way that you might want to share with listeners so maybe they don't make the same ones? Two things jumped to mind immediately. If I had it to do again, and if I next time I go to sell a book, I would not want an agent to submit to 16 editors at once, even if they think it's going to produce an auction that gets us a million dollars. I would say to the agent now, slow roll it. Let's submit to one or two, see what they say. If we get excitement, then we'll open up the round and go to other people too. Rather than a blanket submission like that, that does not give you any room for error. You know, once people in that round start to say no, you don't have a lot of moves left. You can't retool the manuscript and then resubmit because at least in, as I've experienced the world of nonfiction submissions, you only go to an editor one time. Mm -hmm. And it's not like this world is so big. There may be only 30 editors who acquire your kind of book. So if you shoot 16 at once, then you have just eliminated half your pool. So anyway, I would say you have the power to talk to your agent about how many editors you want to submit to at one time. And the other thing I would say is I have a lot of respect for literary agents. I love what they do. They're really smart, cool people in my experience, but also like they're not that different from like a real estate agent. (laughs) You know, they're not fairy godmothers and they're not therapists. They are people who find developed property and they sell it. Mm. And it's cool because it's in the literary world, but they're also like, they're essentially salespeople. And it doesn't necessarily mean that 
they're on some lofty plane that we're not on. Agents are just people to you, I guess is what I'm saying. And maybe that's not that profound a point, but at least when I was coming up, I felt very intimidated by them and as though I couldn't just sort of level with them and talk about my fears and concerns and goals and that sort of thing. And now I'm just way more frank, though not unfiltered, hopefully. Can you share with listeners one of the most important lessons that you learned on your journey to publication? Do you know Kevin Bacon said that the secret of longevity is longevity? I think <laughs> what that means, right? This is literary wisdom from Kevin Bacon, these recognized sources. Uh, is that your next book? <laughs> yeah, Bacon, uh, literary wisdom help. from Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Just keep going. Really, talent is cheap. Even people putting in the effort and time is cheap. But if you are willing to fail for a very long period of time, I do think you're going to get to a breakthrough point. For me, and maybe other people are quicker learners. I would hope they would be. I'm just less naive than I was when I started out. But it really, for me, what worked out in the end was just keeping at it. It wasn't because my early efforts were brilliant. They were definitely not. They were bad. But I kept going until they were slightly less bad. And uh, just sort of learned all along the way. I hate it. I hate it about this business that like doing things wrong is the process. You know, writing a sentence the wrong way is the process. Writing the story the wrong way is the process. Getting your book proposal wrong the first time is the process. But that is what it is. You know, you don't know until you've done it badly. (laughs) That's how you get good over time. I don't think I had the real sense of that going into this. I think like everybody else, I wanted to be a genius from the word go. (laughs) And that's still not happening (laughs) after all this time. Uh, You have to start where you are. This is not a business that most of us succeed in completely on our own. Who are some of the people who helped you along the way and how? My acknowledgments was (laughs) quite a long section because, (laughs) uh, yeah, you're exactly right. We don't do it alone. Two book world professionals that were above and beyond kind and generous to me were Jane Friedman. Mm. She is the loveliest, smartest person and just unbelievably generous with her insight. Uh, So she was extremely helpful. And we sort of ended up becoming, you know, friends through the process. She read early versions of my book proposal. And I have learned so much from her and just from reading her blog and that sort of thing. I'm a really devoted reader of it. And then Ryan Holiday, who's written uh, a number of blockbusters on stoicism I met him fairly early in the process too, and he was just unbelievably generous with his sales insights, marketing insights, and then he he blurbed the book. So we had a front cover blurb from him, which my publisher was very pleased about for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unbelievably nice guy and very smart. And then I have my writer's group in LA. That's where I was living at the time I sold the book. Mm-hmm. A number of just awesome, smart women. Holly James is in it. Her first book, Nothing But the Truth, just came out, which is really cool. I love that book. (laughs) And my friend Stephanie read every draft. My best friend Lizzie sat with me the week before my auction, and we were retooling the writing sample because publishers wanted me to take it in a few different directions. So we had Mm. very little time, um, and she stayed with me through the whole thing. Oh gosh, my longtime writing mentor, Alan Pell Crawford, who's the historian I, I mentioned earlier, he's written books on Jefferson and Twain, and he uh, really helped me understand the historical aspects of what I was doing, because I'm not a trained historian, as much history ended up going into the book. It's crazy. I mean, it's totally, these things are our village. It's weird that there's only <laughs> yeah. one name on a book. Yeah, I've seen some publishers doing credits on books, where they'll they'll have like the assistants, like everyone, you know, the formatter. And I think that's really cool. Catherine, before you go, is there anything additional you want to tell our listeners? Don't be afraid to switch to nonfiction. (laughs) I know that sounds strange, but it's all writing in the end. And there's the same opportunity in fiction as there is in fiction to like create that like fictive dream, especially when you're writing history or biography. I think, you know, you're recreating someone's life circumstances. And also... In my experience, and granted, this may just be too small a sample size to make it worthwhile, but I think nonfiction is way easier to sell. So if you're banging and get your head against the wall with novels for years on end, try some freelance journalism. It can be really rewarding and it allows for those little wins that keep you going. 
I would also say it can be a good thing to pilot your ideas. So if mm -hmm. you're thinking about a subject of a book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, is it possible to write like one internet essay about that thing and just see how it does? Mm -hmm. Even a Twitter thread can be a good way to pilot an idea and see if this thing has legs. I would say there are a lot of other ways to build platform than what we think of, which is like Instagram and Twitter, right? Quora is a surprisingly good way to do it. And so is LinkedIn, the dorkiest, <laughs> nerdiest social media website, right? Um, but people build followings on there. And I talked about my uh, experience on Quora in my book proposal, just because I had been on there answering questions about Poe and starting to build a little bit of an audience that way. Hmm. So I think those are two kind of little known avenues. One truth of this business is that the less prestige there is in a thing, the more opportunity there is for you. Like, hmm. It's very hard to break into something like literary fiction because everybody wants that and it's the most prestigious category. But if you look into ones that are less prestigious, say self-help, that might be a place where you can get a project through because there's less competition or because your credentials look better in that light. Hmm. Interesting. To your point about testing any idea on social media or online, I know agents who now look at TikToks and they see people uh, who are going viral on TikTok talking uh, about certain subjects. I could totally see that. I'm not like a video person yet. I keep meaning to do it, but. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story with everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I love talking shop like this, and I'm such a fan <laughs> of your podcast. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was just binging episodes this morning, the Paulette Kennedy one and oh, yeah. uh, Jessica Strauser. And... Oh, nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for listening to this episode of Queries, Qualms, and Quirks. You can find the text of Catherine's query in the show notes, along with links to find out more about her and her book. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate if you'd help me find new listeners by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser, telling your friends, or sharing this episode on social media. If you're interested in supporting the show, go to patreon.com slash Sarah Nicholas. That is a new link for this year, and that is Sarah with an H and Nicholas with no H. And if you're a published author interested in being a guest on the show, please click on the home base link in the description, or go to sarahnicholas.com and click on the podcast logo in the sidebar. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.